In Sri Lanka, at least 91 people have died and 110 are still missing after heavy monsoon rains triggered deadly floods and landslides in the south and western parts of the country. The country's disaster management center said that nearly 8,000 people have been displaced by flooding in the affected areas. Heavy rains that began on Thursday are expected to continue and the government has advised people living near swollen rivers and hilly slopes to evacuate their homes. Right?
But uh, it's not uh, Tamil Nadu alone. We've seen a heat wave in Telangana as well. Let's take you through the story that we've got. At least 161 people have died due to heat stroke in Telangana. Hyderabad Traffic Police has now taken up a cool initiative to beat the heat. 200 cooling jackets were distributed to city's Traffic Police Joint Commissioner A. Ravindra to beat the heat. The astonishing initiative was taken up by the Hyderabad Traffic Police for the well-being of its officers to cope up with the intensity. The best part about the jacket is that it keeps the body temperature at 6 to 12 degrees Celsius lower than the outside temperature depending on the humidity of the environment. Meteorological department though has issued a fresh uh, heat wave warning for next five days in isolated districts of uh, Telangana. According to our special report, we've been extensively tracking the drought in Tamil Nadu and today we look at this unexpected impact. Nearly 10 lakh coconut trees are said to have dried up in the Salem district. Around 10 lakh coconut trees dead across Salem district. Sites of tragedy as we drive through. Sendil Kumar has lost around 700 coconut trees. Hello. Many a quarter century old. The family had switched from paddy to coconut in the 90s due to shortage of water. Now 24 years of their labor and livelihood lost. More than 20 30 years will be cultivated for this coconut tree. Right now, if it is not there, what can I do? It will be very difficult to live for that here, but we will quit that agriculture totally. Each tree earned around 1,000 rupees a year. Now thousands of them uprooted and sold as firewood. Coconut saplings take five years to yield. With no other source of income, many like Rajendran are abandoning this cash crop. The government is yet to announce a package, but coconut farmers want at least 10,000 rupees for every tree.
வந்து கிட்டத்தட்ட ஐயாயிரம் பேர் வசித்து வரோம் சார் ஒரு ஏரி இருக்குது ஏரினா ஒரு அறுநூறு ஏக்கர் ஏரி பெரிய ஏரி அந்த பராமரிப்பு இல்லாமல் இருக்குது அதெல்லாம் வறண்டு போயிடுச்சு ஆறு வெண்ணாறு வெண்ணாறும் வறண்டு போயிடுச்சு தண்ணிங்கிறதே குடிக்கிறதுக்கு தண்ணி இன்னும் ஒரு மதத்துக்கு மேலே வருமாங்கிறதே எங்களுக்கு ஒரு சந்தேகத்தில் இருக்கோம் எல்லாருமே ரெண்டு போக்கத்தில் இப்போ இவ்வா அதிகமாக இப்போ வர லேட்டாக லேட்டாக வர வர தான் சமீபமாக தான் நாங்கள் பாதி பாதி நடுறோம் ஃபுல்லாக எங்களால் பண்ண முடியல எங்களால் தண்ணி சப்ளை கொடுக்க முடியல அப்படி மீறி நட்டாலும் அதுக்கு சப்ளை கொடுக்காம அது வேஸ்டேஜ் ஆகிடுது சரிங்களா நிறைய அதிக செலவாகுது இடத்துல நெல் பயிர் தான் நாங்கள் சாகுபடி பண்ணலாம் அந்த நெல் பயிருக்கு போதுமான தண்ணி கிடையாது ஒன்று காவேரியில் தண்ணி வரணும் இல்லை போர் சுட்டுக்கணும் போர் தண்ணி இப்போ படு மோசமாக பாதத்துக்கு போயிடுச்சு என்ன கடு வறட்சி தான் வறட்சியில் சுத்தமாக இந்த அஞ்சு வயசு காலமாக நஷ்டம் எனக்கு அவர் பெரும் நஷ்டம் நஷ்டம் ஏற்பட்டு பேங்கில் கடன் வாங்கினது நகை ஒன்று வச்சது பத்திரத்தை கடன் வாங்கினது எல்லாமே கடனில் மூக்க கடனை தவிச்சுக்கிட்டு தற்கொலை பண்ணிக்கிட்டு இன்றைக்கி தமிழ்நாடு ஃபுல்லாக இன்சூர் குமார் இரநூத்தம்பது விவசாயிகள் இன்றைக்கி தற்கொலை பண்ணிக்கிட்டாங்க என்ன அந்த நிலமை தான் நாளைக்கு எனக்கும் வரும்போல் இருக்கு மாடு தான் இப்போதைக்கு எங்களுக்கு அந்த ஆடு மாடு தான் சோறு போடுற மாதிரி இருக்குது விவசாயம் சுத்தமாக எதுவுமே இல்லை எங்களுக்கு there was a regular flow of water at least people have raised some two two crops but now this year it's very difficult here past two years there is lot of issues and this year it is very critical because the local rain uh, rain is only 50% we are a delta people we are totally dependent on the canal irrigation for raising paddy here so here this year if you see there is hardly around some 20 to 30 days of water flow in that canal The city of Cape Town's drought crisis worsens as dam levels reach critical levels. The Department of Water and Sanitation visited areas of the province which has recently been declared a disaster area. ANN 7's Nasipi Same filed this report. Desperate times call for desperate measures. The Western Cape is going all out to tackle water scarcity. Deployment of resources is being fast-tracked after the province was declared a disaster area. Level 4 water restrictions have been announced amid the worst drought in more than a century. We're in one of the um, sites of the Western Cape, which is one of the strategic uh, water sources for the city of Cape Town and other critical uh, water users in this part of South Africa. And uh, what we have been engaging on is to find solutions for the short to medium that can also survive uh, going into the long term. God. The city of Cape Town mayor hosted an interfaith prayer meeting for rain. The purpose of getting together today at the foot of Table Mountain, the uh, iconic Ma Table Mountain in our city, uh, is to bring all the religious leaders from all the religious faith together and to pray for rain. We are in a crisis situation. Uh, the water is running out very fast. And we now need some divine intervention too. But more over and above that, it is up to every single Cape Townian to help us to save water. Cape Town has experienced some rainfall, but not nearly enough to beat the drought ravaging the city. If we have extremely above normal rainfall, these, these, these dams are, are normally about one and a half to two MAR, which is mean annual runoff. So it implies that it would take up to two seasons to fill of normal rainfall. Uh, but as you saw within uh, the uh, Gauteng situation that we had with the fallout from, uh, from that cyclone, Ex Deneo, 
Uh, it took us about four to five days to bring the system back to normal. So with, a, with an abnormal rain event, it can fill over, overnight nearly. Meanwhile, communities face further pressure with water tariffs set to increase. With Nasi Pisame in Cape Town, Bureau Report, ANN7. To South Africa now, where Cape Town's water reserves are running dangerously low, and it's in one of the worst droughts in a century. It's now plaguing the city. Certainly, our meteorologist Derek Van Dam has been following the story, and Derek, th this is a serious situation. Yeah, you're right, George. Paula, uh, residents of Cape Town are waiting on a miracle. They're waiting for the skies to open up, bring some rain to help relieve this drought that is, again, like you said, Paula, the worst drought in over a century. And wow, it is bad. But we want to try and put this drought into perspective so you can at least understand what's happening here. So let's talk about how much water you and I use on average, 300 to 375 liters per day. Now, the city of Cape Town is considering level four water restrictions. That's limiting the residents of Cape Town to only 100 liters of water per day. Think about that. All the things and the tasks that we use water for that we take for granted, brushing your teeth, watering your lawn, washing your car, doing laundry, those will either be banned or restricted with the potential level four restrictions uh, that Cape Town is considering as we speak. There are five major dams that supply Cape Town with its drinking water, its usable water. And right now those dams collectively are sitting at 21.2% storage. So they're only 21.2% full, which is down from a week ago. What's also interesting to note is that the last 10% of that percentage is actually unusable water. So effectively, Cape Town only has 11% of usable water left in their reserves. Some estimates say less than 60 days of water available to the residents of Cape Town. You can see the concern here. So here are three of the largest dams surrounding Cape Town. This is the Western Cape. We have the Fofle Dam, the Berg River Dam, and the Tia Vadas Kloof Dam just outside of the mother city. And we actually had a video blogger, Adam Spires, send a drone into the skies to see what the Tiervatas Kloof Dam actually looks like. And you can see the expansive dry landscape. This should all be filled in with water. And you can also see the uh, brown rim right around the edge of this reservoir indicating the low, low water levels. That bridge is roughly about 20 meters high. In fact, Adam likes to tell the story when he took his drone to this reservoir. He used to play on this bridge when he was young and he could actually jump into the water. And uh, that was a common thing that people did now, but that is not going to happen this time around because unfortunately the reservoir has pretty much completely dried up. Get back to the graphics. What is exactly going on here? Well, we have shifting weather patterns across South Africa for a number of reasons. We also have a uh, just a population that is just starting to expand significantly into Cape Town. So we're putting a lot of stress on the resources there. But we're also noticing an area of high pressure that's uh, permanently placed across the South Atlantic and that continues to expand. And effectively, it's pushing away the winter cold fronts that would typically bring winter Cape Town rain. And it is shifting it further south of the country. So we are drying things out and we're seeing this long-term desertification is the term. And in fact, there have been computer models that suggest that over the next century, by the end of uh, this century at least, we have the potential to see a two to six degree Celsius warming trend across the western and central parts of Cape Town. No rain in this forecast this weekend and through the per first parts of next week. We don't get into our rainy season until uh, the first week of June, really, in Cape Town. But all models indicate that it is going to stay dry into the mother city. And wow, what a, a, a sight to see those uh, dramatic aerial visuals of the reservoirs and how dry it actually is there, Paula, George. Uh, Cape Town, the overrunning theme here, you need to conserve water. This is not a short-term problem, it's a long-term issue. Yeah, it's a big is, deal. Wow. is that even going to do anything at yeah. that point? They need rain. Exactly. Right? That's yeah. why they are waiting on a miracle.
Not only do the residents of the drought-stricken areas have to go for days on end without food, but they also have to bear the brunt of its effects. Here in a village in Bulgabo, a pungent smell fills the air as bones are strewn all over and a pile of dry carcass lays right in front of their homes. Drought is so bad here, yeah? as you just see it here. Yeah. It is something very nasty. Always, every morning, children are going bare barefooted just like you have seen it. It is continuing for around two and a half years now. It is so bad, I take it to my heart, it is so bad. Even we try to burn it, it becomes out of us in our hand as a community, just here. Yeah. Mm, so bad, something very bad. People you see the hedge, the lactating mothers, they are all now weak, very weak. Thousands of hungry Somalis are on the move. The true scale of this human tragedy is laid bare on the outskirts of the city of Baidoa, 250 kilometers from the capital Mogadishu. The hunger and suffering we've gone through is beyond description. We haven't eaten anything since yesterday. There's nothing. On a rocky piece of land on the outskirts of Baidoa, the displaced built huts which look like bird nests discarded sticks, the making of a home. They won't provide much protection from the searing heat in the day and cold nights. They join two million others already displaced by conflict and past droughts in Somalia. The current drought has thrown more than three million people into a food crisis. At least a half of them are children who need treatment for malnutrition, hunger, lack of clean drinking water and diseases are claiming the lives of more people every day. Reaching those in need is a major challenge. Al-Shabaab fighters still control large parts of southern Somalia. Many seek shelter in government-controlled areas. Dozens arrive daily in this makeshift camp on the outskirts of Mogadishu. Exhausted and starving, men and women holding children crying from hunger. Hassan Hussein lost six of his children to hunger and diseases in the past few months. We haven't received much help in this camp. If you look around, you will notice more than 90% of the women are not here. They are either gone to do menial jobs or are begging in the city. Aid agencies have scaled up efforts, but say more support is urgently needed. The Somali government was elected three months ago and is still trying to find its feet. The Prime Minister says Somalis are to blame for the latest tragedy. What gives me sleepless nights is, um, is the fact that we could avoid this. The world is not responsible. We as Somalis need to look ourselves and think what can we do to prevent these tragedies. Most of the displaced will continue to stay in these camps long after the food crisis is over. Their farms have failed and their animals have died. With no help in restoring livelihoods in sight, the best chance of surviving their land of birth may be by leaving it behind. Mohamed Adawal Jazeera, Mogadishu, Somalia. Thank you. 
Ich Oh, Alter, komm dir jetzt Katasztrófa turizmus van. Elakadt az angol nagykövet. Így néz ki a bent tenger, ott úszik egy kuka. Megmutatom a lábamat. Az ideig ér a vízbe. Mondjuk ezt. Aha. Ciao, vannak még kemény emberek. Hát ez. Csóri. És ami az egészben a legnagyobb ciki, bement a Bambiba a víz, és, és bezárt. Katasztrófa turizmus van. A devastating scene in downtown Salem Friday night. Cars, businesses, and homes under several feet of water. It is the same area hard hit by floodwaters more than a decade before. I was thinking of 04 when this happened, and it stopped right at the edge of our building, so it wasn't this bad. It's why Aaron and Jason Bontrager, the pastors of Legacy Church, made the decision to leave the church and drive home members of their youth group. But during that hour, the rains kept coming, and the floodwaters continued to rise. Sort of a gut-wrenching feeling as I was driving over here, knowing that it was just going to keep coming. At Miller's Hardware on Walnut Street, the owner and his father-in-law never left, determined to save what they could. But just before 7, they found themselves trapped. At that point, we couldn't even push the door open. It was too deep to even push with all the pressure on it, so we couldn't get out the door. So that's why we went out the window. These pictures show their rescue by local firefighters. Seven people, a baby, even a dog taken to higher ground. For the next several hours, they watched what they couldn't save float away. And for those that call Salem home, there was little else to do than just that and wait. So now we're just going to be positive and do our best. We'll clean it up and get it back to go. A couple friends that are going after chainsaws and a backhoe. We're going to cut it into smaller pieces take a chain and pull it out. Robert Frost says it won't be a one day job cleaning up after Friday night's flood. The water so high it was inside his recently departed mother's mobile home. There's no easy solution to it. We're going to bring a horse trailer in, get all the furniture out, cut the rugs, of course, get them out in small pieces. Then I'm going to take my hose and wash this muddy water out. Then I'm going to get some fans and some kerosene heaters in here because I don't have no power and try to dry everything out and hope for the best. Downstream, two petroleum tanks and three semi-trailers that were carried off smashed into this bridge on South Main Street. Duke Energy worked to restore power after a utility pole snapped. Danny Walton sized up the damage at his nearby office and music instrument shop. Well, I did talk to my insurance agent and he said, you know, we can go ahead and inventory stuff and just, you know, you know, hopefully get a dumpster or something and start, you know, starting, you know, and, and I, I don't know how I'm going to clean it up. I'm going to have to pull all the drywall off and pegboard off and, and, you know, insulation and all that. Walton runs Danny's Heating and Air Conditioning. This is one of his vans. He tried to load his guitars into this red pickup before it was swept away. But that being said, it's amazing how many people are saying, you know, just call me. Frost says the whole community has a big job ahead. It's just going to take time and work. One of the great things about Salem, a lot of neighbors here are pitching in to help each other out. 
In Salem, Mark Vanderoff, WLKY News. En tiempos normales, ahora es que sin la seca, aquí se recibe agua todos los días por el sistema, ¿no? Bueno, hubo que solicitar por parte de Acoducto una pipa para distribuir el agua porque el agua no llega a estas viviendas. Están montadas con planes de, de otro tipo de grano que llevan menos agua. Y entonces tenemos ya previsto la cantidad de, de estos cultivos que vamos a sembrar aquí, que llevan en estos momentos, como les decía, menos agua que el arroz. Una de las medidas más importantes es darle un manejo adecuado al agua con la que hoy contamos. Eh, eh, llegan las precipitaciones, se produce el escurrimiento, lo almacenamos, los embalses, o sea, en toda la infraestructura hidráulica que tenemos para ella. Una de las medidas que debemos llevar a cabo es de la utilización de las plantas, de las plantas desalinizadoras, o sea, darle utilidad al agua del mar, siempre que sea posible. Los sistemas de riego, también el Ministerio de la Agricultura toma medidas para el enfrentamiento a la sequía. Eh, cambiando de cultivo, de lugares y buscando tecnología eficiente para el riego de la misma. Residents in flood-affected communities including Sand Hill, Chinapau and Wiper in Region 8 have started to receive assistance, Minister of State Joseph Harmon has disclosed. In providing an update on the flood situation in the interior region, Harmon said that a team from the Civil Defense Commission was dispatched to the area earlier today. Um, an aircraft um, should have left to Mary at 11 o'clock today to have a first-hand look and do a proper assessment as to what the true situation is. But I can say to you that Civil Defense Commission, they have already started taking steps to get relief to those persons who are there. Again, the Defense Patrol is um, in a village not very far away from this, this, this area, and that patrol will also be having a look at what has happened there so that we can bring relief to the residents. Residents are also receiving support from the Ghana Defense Force, which has a presence in the community assessing the situation to provide relief. At Chidapau, the report from the chair, chairman there that 10 houses were halfway flooded and one was swept away. The population is about 591 persons and request was made here for food and clothing. It is important to know that some of these uh, communities are, are in valleys and therefore when the rains come down heavily, um, the waters come down from the mountains and they flood these villages. Harmon says President David Granger was informed of the situation and has given certain directions to the CDC and to the regional administration for actions to be taken. Heavy rainfall in the region has caused several villages to be affected by flash flooding. Samuel Suknandan, The Evening News. We've come to see Lake Popo, Bolivia's second largest. In wetter days, it covered nearly 400 square miles. But the lake is all but gone. It's just a cemetery of boats. It's like the Sahara Desert coughed up a bunch of 
fishing skiffs or something. The water must have gone down so fast, people just had no way to get their boats out of here and they just left them and moved on. Look at this little fishing boat. Whoever owned this thing must have decided, number one, there's no fishing left. Number two, I, I'll never get my boat out of here. Where am I gonna put it? An entire lifestyle just evaporated with this lake. Lake Popo was a shallow lake, only about 10 feet deep. Its size always fluctuated with the seasons. It's even dried up before. But this time, no one around here thinks it's coming back. Village leaders in what was once the shoreline community of Choro are anxious. One of the worst droughts in Bolivia's modern history has left this region parched. Last fall, Bolivia's capital, La Paz, was literally running out of water. It's since rained a bit, but not here, 300 miles away. Right now we're on our way to a bridge to the only river of eight that is still feeding Lake Popo from Lake Titicaca. The other seven have completely dried up. This is the Desaguadero River. What swampland remains of Lake Popo is due to this influx of water. Choro town leader Mario Ibarra says the river is the region's last lifeline. Si no hay agua, muere el pueblo. Sí. Y hay algunos lugares que no tienen esa agua, no hay gente. With every passing month, the desaguadero brings less and less water, and it's more and more polluted. Animales, pero personas sí. no. No. Let's see how it comes from here. ¿Y ustedes beben entonces de, de agua este plástico? Sí, ahorita, en esta época, pero después, marzo, abril, mayo, muy poco. Ya no haber esto del río que tomamos. Haciendo hervito, de eso. The water here used to be crystalline, but then something began to change. Hours away and slightly higher on the Bolivian plains. It's called El Alto. Once a small suburb above the capital, La Paz, it's now home to nearly two million people. Sewers here are in short supply. Waste management, virtually non-existent. Most human waste from this megalopolis runs into the ground. Garbage goes into open landfills. When it rains, all of it washes downhill and into tributaries that feed another well-known Bolivian lake, Titicaca. On the border with Peru, two hours northeast from El Alto, Titicaca is the world's highest navigable body of water some 900 legendary square miles of blue. Well, blue and increasingly slime green. We got to the lake about 30 seconds ago and we've already found our first dead fish. One local mayor, Alfredo Ferrero, is deeply worried for the lake's future. Ya se nota porque en las orillas del lago el color ya es diferente y además los peces ya están Apareciendo muertos, los caraches desaparecen también algunas veces. Eh, el lago medio oscuro ya, ya no es cristalino. Unos cinco años atrás más o menos ha empezado ya este tema porque al principio la gente misma estaba esperanzada de que con la pesca que tenían las personas, pensado que van a mantener ahí, pero no es así. Ferrero and several area mayors huddle at an emergency meeting to discuss the problem and hopefully find solutions. Octavio Quispe calls what's happening liquid injustice. No sacan agua limpia de las cordilleras, utiliza la ciudad y la ciudad nos devuelve agua contaminada prácticamente que afecta a los originarios, a las comunidades que son originarios de la región. ¿Y qué pasaría si llega un turista a este lago tan mítido y huele a aguas negras? No, sería pues eh, prácticamente desastroso la imagen misma, ¿no? Ojalá que esta contaminación no avance. Tenemos islas en el lago que son, que tienen atractivos turísticos. We head for one of those islands with researcher Gonzalo Lora. But first, a detour into a totora. You can't do this with an amateur uh, sailor because you can get stuck in the totora. Totora is a sedge that thrives in Titicaca's shallower waters. It's a sanctuary for ducks and frogs and fish. 
In some communities, they've even made floating islands out of it. It's also a natural barrier against a lot of human pollutants, soaking them up for their nutrient value. But the waste flow into Titicaca is overwhelming the Totora. This is causing the algae to bloom out of control, setting off a dangerous chain of events. Contaminants come in, they cloud up the water, that blocks the sun, and that allows the algae underneath to bloom. Yes, sir. And they take oxygen out of the water, and that affects the natural plants and the fish. Yes. Down there, they begin to bloom anaerobic uh, bacteria. So they, in their process, liberate uh, uh, hydrogen sulfur. Okay. That it's a hydrogen sulfur that smells, and that kills the frogs, the fish, all that kind of, uh, of biodiversity, and affects all the food chain. And it stinks. Not really. No, it gets worse than this? Yeah. Oof, imagine that. Much worse. The strong smell wafts up over the nearby island of Suriki, home to some 500 people. Gervasio Quispe is a resident and local historian. He takes me up the mountain to show me what they're up against. Había muchos peces cuando yo era niño. ¿Sí? No había esas redes. Solamente nosotros en, entrábamos a la orilla. ¿Sí? Hay algas que hay, hay. entonces lo sacamos junto a las algas, cogían a los peces. ¿Ah, sí? ¿Tantos sí, peces había? Tantos. Nos criábamos las truchas y llegó la agua turbia. Cuando una mañana nomás vemos todas las jaulas, las truchas muertas. Quispe says he's worried that bad water down there could leach into the island's natural spring, the town's only source of water, this tiny trickle. Y cuando la sequía estaba muy fuerte, ¿cuánto tiempo esperaba la gente aquí para, tener, para llenar sus bedones? Un bedón de, do, de 20 litros, más o menos, eso siempre traen, algunos de 10, 5, así. Digamos de 20 litros a... Por lo menos 10 a 15 minutos. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Entonces, la espera en la cola, ¿cuánto cola, era la, la espera? Según la llegada. Por eso muchas veces uh, sigue ahora. Venimos a las 3 de la mañana. To stop the steady onslaught of wastewater, Bolivia and Peru have formed a partnership to build waste treatment plants. Bolivia has earmarked $85 million for two plants already. But experts say at least 20 treatment centers are needed because the damage being done reaches beyond the lake itself. Other UNESCO tourist sites, such as the 800-year-old ruins at Tiwanaco, will also suffer, says this local guide named Marcelo. De esto, del turismo que vive de, su, de, de esa naturaleza que tiene ahí. Marcelo, like most Bolivians, believes it's not too late for Titicaca. But pollution is one thing. The pattern of ever drier weather is another. Titicaca's tributaries are evaporating because of it. The lake is two meters shallower than normal. That's a drop in this highland bucket, but enough to stop runoff from flowing further downhill via the Desaguadero River. Remember which lake that feeds? Lake Popo. In the tiny community of Pasna, few people hold out, like this woman, Mercedes, who's trying to grow quinoa on the lake bed itself. ¿Usted se acuerda de aquí? Antes se pudo ver el lago. Sí. Aquí estaba el, el, el agua también. Sí, el agua tenía antes. Y la tierra aquí es muy buena para sembrar. Un poco salitres. Here at Popo, a vicious circle closes. Urban sprawl pollutes one lake, drought and global warming choke off this one entirely. In a way, Mercedes' little farm is a symbol of how resigned people now are. After all, if you really have hope that your lake's coming back, you don't start farming on a spot that should be underwater. <laughs>